Good day. I'm your host, Gerald Goldfarb, and this is Inside Law. As our regular viewers know, Inside Law is a television program where we try to give members of the public an accurate and inside view about how the legal system operates. Many of us nowadays are exposed to kind of fantasy views about the legal system. The old Perry Mason programs, nowadays there's uh, L.A. Law, and we want to give a more realistic and inside picture about how the legal system operates. I'm a lawyer here in Los Angeles, a, a sole practitioner, and uh, oftentimes we have guests on the show to discuss various subjects of interest. Today uh, we're going to not have any guests, and we're going to have a discussion on uh, the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution, which I think uh, you will discover as the show goes on is a matter of some concern to you as a citizen of the United States. It's not a technical matter which involves other people. It's a matter that involves you and your family and your relatives uh, in a very direct way. The Fourth Amendment is, of course, uh, a part of the Bill of Rights. The first ten amendments to the Constitution make up the Bill of Rights. And uh, the Fourth Amendment I'll, uh, is a short like most of the crucial phrases and, and uh, aspects of the Constitution, the Fourth Amendment is uh, really just a, uh, just a longish sentence. But uh, there have been realms and realms of cases and uh, many, many aspects of concern uh, involved. Now, here is what the Fourth Amendment actually says. And I'd like you to concentrate and think about the particular words. They all have meaning to them. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Now that's a little bit of a convoluted sentence, but it is only one sentence, yet uh, it has implications for all of our lives. Let's take it a little bit in uh, historical context to see what it really means. What it really means historically is that the police cannot just uh, seize you or search you. They can't search your pockets, they can't search your house. They can't do those sorts of things, which in a totalitarian country like the Soviet Union, they can do without any hesitation. Before the police can search or seize you or your property, as a general rule, as the amendment says, the police have to have a warrant. Now, what is a warrant? A warrant is a document signed by a judicial officer, usually a judge, which gives permission to the police to do the searching and seizing that they want to do. In other words, before the police can do any searching or seizing, they have to go to a neutral party, a judge, and they have to make a presentation to this judge, and they have to say to the judge, look, we have these various facts that have come to our attention, this, these various pieces of information. And based on this information, we have a good idea that John Smith is doing something wrong. So please give us a warrant. Please give us permission to search John Smith's house so we can find out if he has any contraband, if he has any drugs, if he has any atomic secrets, if he has any uh, illegal, uh, maybe he's got counterfeiting equipment, whatever John Smith may have. Now, as you can readily see, this is a great safeguard uh, to prevent the police from just uh, dropping in on anybody's house uh, that they want to. And this is uh, really based on history. The warrant requirement goes back before the United States Constitution to the English uh, common law. Now, based on, with, uh, using that as a background, uh, we see that there's been a lot of elaboration uh, over the last couple of hundred years upon what that Fourth Amendment means and what the proper balance is between the police and, uh, and the public. Uh, nobody wants the police to be handcuffed. We need the police to protect us from dangerous persons out there. At the same time, we don't want the police uh, to run rampant. 
Now, if you just start at the basic place, you think about your own house. There's an old phrase uh, that we all love in America that a man's, nowadays a woman's, a man's or a woman's home is his or her castle. The idea being that it's inviolate, that nobody can get into your home, your castle, uh, unless you give them permission to do so. Now, of course, that's not entirely right. If the magistrate or the judge gives the police officer a uh, warrant, they can enter your house uh, without your permission. Although, uh, there are certain rules of uh, courtesy that have evolved. Uh, we, all, we not only require our police to get a warrant, we require our police to use that warrant in a well-mannered and courteous way. If the police want to have a warrant to search your apartment or your house, they've got to knock on the door first. And they have to say, hello, where are the police? If you don't answer the door. They have to say, hello, where are the police? And we're coming to serve a warrant on you. And still, if you don't answer, then they can break down your door. Uh, a lot of the police officers don't like that rule. They say it gives the uh, homeowner an opportunity to flush uh, his contraband down the toilet or to otherwise uh, dispose of it. But those are the requirements uh, that we put upon the police. And again, because we don't want them bursting into a person's house, even with a warrant, without giving some kind of warning. Uh, uh, even if they have a warrant, you may be engaged in private or personal matters and uh, we don't want the police to disturb them uh, if it's not necessary for them to do so. So the basic proposition is a man's home is his castle, but there can be a warrant obtained to search your home and to seize things that are in it. Now, what can they seize? They can only seize what's described uh, in the warrant or what's in plain view. Uh, they can't go through, well, even if they have a warrant and they say, we have reason to believe that John Smith has counterfeiting money in his basement and the judge gives him permission to search the house and seize all the counterfeiting plates. And they go into John Smith's house and uh, they're looking for counterfeiting plates and uh, they go back into uh, a drawer in the basement and they find a, a bag of marijuana. Well, they're not entitled to take that bag of marijuana. They can only take what the warrant says they can take because that's what the law is. So again, this limits what the police can do. Uh, they can get into your house, they can make reasonable searches, but they can't, uh, uh, they can't make what is called an exploratory search. They can't search for anything that they might possibly find hidden away in the recesses of your house. If you've got your contraband sitting on your dresser, they're looking for, for counterfeiting, but they see a bag of marijuana on your dresser, they can take that because that's in plain view. There's no exploration going on. So there's sort of a lesser uh, violation of your privacy that's occurring. Now, let's take this a step further and see what the law has been doing in recent years. I think we need to say up front that, as you'll see in this program, there's been a trend going on. There's been a trend, at least for the last 10 years, toward uh, favoring the, law, the balance toward the law enforcement personnel and away from privacy. I think we'd all agree that the reason for this trend, which we will discover, is the sort of anti-drug hysteria that has gripped our culture. Many of us uh, are concerned with the way that the use of drugs has uh, caused problems in the private and public life. And as a result, the courts have been more inclined to give the police more leeway in the searches and seizures that they undertake. Uh, whether or not this leeway has become excessive is really the question. We recognize, of course, that the judges are appointed by the executive branch. Our federal judges are appointed by the president. Our state judges are appointed by Governor Duke Magian. Now, we've had Republicans in the State House and in the Capitol in Washington uh, for a good many years now, and naturally, being of a more conservative bent. They've appointed more conservative judges, and the more conservative judges uh, have had a tendency really to not to be so conservative, but to actually uh, be uh, in favor of change, in favor of expanding the authorities uh, of the police within the boundaries of the Fourth Amendment. Now, we start off with the basic notion that we have the house and a man's home is his castle. 
unless uh, they have a warrant. Now, what about a man's backyard? Is that part of his castle or is that not part of his castle? Traditionally, the, the word uh, for that territory that's sort of attached to your house. If you live in a rural area, it may be more than a backyard. Uh, it may be a quarter acre or a half an acre. But the word that is used is the word curtilage, C-U-R-T-I-L-A-G-E. And curtilage refers to the territory or land that you, that's attached and associated to your house. Traditionally, the curtilage was entitled to the same safeguards as the actual physical structure. The notion being that it was all part and parcel of your castle. Now, what has developed over time is a diminishment of the protection for the curtilage. A lot of uh, marijuana growers, particularly, were using the curtilage to grow illegal plants. Either they were just growing them flat out in their backyard, or they were setting up some kind of informal greenhouses to, uh, uh, to grow it more efficiently. The police, uh, the law enforcement personnel wanted to search this curtilage. And they didn't want to have to borrow, they didn't want to have to bother trying to get a warrant. It wasn't so easy to get a warrant. If a person put a 10-foot fence around his curtilage, and the police couldn't see what was going inside, they couldn't very well get a warrant because they didn't have any, any reasonable, they didn't have any probable cause to believe something illicit was going on. They might have had a uh, suspicion about what was going on, but suspicion is not enough to get a warrant. So the police started to use airplanes and helicopters to fly over the territory, to fly over the curtilage. And the courts were very confused about this for quite a while. There was a lot of conflict in the California cases as to whether or not you could fly over someone's curtilage or backyard, examine it with a, uh, with a binoculars and see what you could see, and then go and get a warrant to search and seize the uh, illicit plants. Uh, some judges thought this wasn't a search at all because, uh, in a manner of speaking, uh, your backyard is in plain view if, you're, if it's being flown over by an airplane. Some courts said, well, it's okay to fly if you're flying over kind of casually very high up in the air, that's not a search. But if you fly uh, low over the property, that's a search, you need a warrant for it. And so you can't base your warrant, base getting a warrant on what you've seen from a low overflight. But the courts went back and forth for a while, and the bottom line seems to be nowadays that, uh, based on recent United States Supreme Court decisions, that there's no limitation on what the police can do in terms of overflight. So whatever you have in your backyard nowadays is vulnerable to a police oversight, whether it's illicit drugs or whether it's nude sunbathing or whether it is uh, some other questionable activity. Maybe you're running a nudist camp back there. The police are entitled nowadays to fly over your property and look at it. So the only thing you can do is kind of put an astrodome or some sort uh, over your property if you want to protect it from law enforcement personnel. That can cost you a few dollars, but it, if you've got something that you really want to keep private back there, then uh, that's about the only thing you can do. So that's one tendency in which uh, the Fourth Amendment has moved toward the uh, powers of the police and away from the privacy of the citizen. Another area is in the area of automobiles. Traditionally, uh, you didn't really have to get a warrant to search an automobile because the automobile would drive away, and by the time the police got the warrant, the automobile would be gone. So if police could make an arrest, they could search the automobile, but they couldn't search the trunk of the automobile or a locked container in the automobile. They could search your person and whatever was in plain view in the automobile. The balance being that if you had things locked in your trunk or in a locked container, that you had a right to privacy, and the police had to get a warrant before they could get into your trunk or get into your locked container. This, of course, proved to be something of a problem for the police. They didn't want to, at 2 o'clock in the morning when they stopped your car and they smelled uh, some illicit substance in it, they didn't want to have to rush off to some magistrate and try to get a warrant to see what was in your trunk. 
and uh, the cases, after a lot of legal dispute, finally got to the point, particularly in the United States Supreme Court, that, uh, that uh, you didn't have to get a warrant anymore. And nowadays, the police can pretty much search anything in your car. If they, if they stop you legitimately, uh, they can search your trunk, search lock containers. Whatever they find is fair game. So your right to privacy in your car is very much diminished over the last five years. Now, what about, the interesting question got to be, what about a mobile home? Is a mobile home a house so that you've got to get a warrant? Or is a mobile home like a car that the police can just search without question? Uh, a very interesting uh, matter. Courts love questions like this. How do you divide the, how do you, what kind of, which side of the line is the question uh, resolved upon. In the early cases when we had a liberal California Supreme Court, when Rose Elizabeth Byrd was the Chief Justice, the courts in California said that a mobile home was like a house and the police couldn't search a mobile home without a proper warrant. But uh, the courts, the personnel of the courts have changed. The California Supreme Court has changed. And nowadays, those decisions are no longer good law. And nowadays, your mobile home is just like uh, your car. So a man's home may be his castle, but a man's motor home is not. And uh, if you've got uh, nefarious activities or questionable activities or just activities that you want to remain private, uh, you're a lot better off renting a house than carrying on uh, in a mobile home. Uh, of course, these matters came up most frequently where mobile homes were used by young people as kind of, uh, 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 it used to be the back seat of the family car was the place of privacy for a young couple and got to be that mobile homes and vans were. And the police uh, uh, would sometimes smell uh, odd fragrances coming uh, from these uh, vehicles and they wanted to be able to intercede and the courts have given them the authority to do that. So again, your mobile home uh, is not a castle, even though your home may be. Now, another area where this has come up uh, recently is in trash. The, the California Supreme Court decided in 1973 that uh, when you put your trash out, uh, it was still your trash, and the police couldn't search your trash. And uh, that was the law for many years. Uh, but the police, again, didn't like this rule because they found that there was very interesting material in people's trash. If they had some suspicion, they could go through the trash. They might find nefarious merchandise in the trash, maybe some drugs, sometimes stolen goods uh, or, or goods that were stolen but had been discarded. Other evidence, all sorts of papers and records that people might have, uh, income tax or other uh, records. So. Uh, the police took on the habit of searching the trash of people they were suspicious of. If they found something interesting in the trash, then they'd use that evidence to get a warrant to search the actual house. And the courts uh, have resisted that, but right now there is a case pending in the California Supreme Court which raises the question as whether people retain a right of privacy in the garbage that they put out for the trash collector. And given the makeup of the Supreme Court nowadays, I think it's, there's a very good probability that uh, the, this uh, traditional rule from 1973 will be discarded and the police will have a carte blanche to examine your trash. Again, the lesson is, uh, if you've got some private m material, you, uh, you give that uh, private, you will shortly, I think, be giving up that privacy when you, uh, when you put it in your trash. The expectation of privacy will be lost. Now this may mean that every family's got to buy a document shredder or a trash compactor to keep your trash from prying eyes. Again, that's a, an extra expense that most people want, don't want to have, but uh, you need to bear that in mind uh, if you've got questionable material that you're putting out uh, uh, for garbage. Here's another area in which the tension between uh, privacy and between uh, the, uh, uh, the law enforcement interest has some tension, and that has to do with phone booths and the listening in on telephone conversations in phone booths. 
the Supreme Court long ago in a famous case called Katz versus United States said that people have an expectation of privacy in their phone conversations and the police couldn't listen in on those conversations. Uh, nowadays, uh, however, these restrictions are being weakened and it's easier than it used to be for the police to get a warrant to listen in on your telephone conversations. When I was a young lawyer in the United States Department of Justice in Washington, I used to have the uh, questionable privilege of reading tape recordings, of, of uh, reading the transcriptions of tape recordings of suspected uh, criminals who, uh, were, uh, who the government was taping. And nowadays it's a lot easier to get a warrant to record somebody's conversation. The expectation of privacy is considered less. Uh, so again, if you're having conversations on the telephone, you're at risk that the government's going to listen to those conversations either with uh, or even without a warrant. So if you want to keep your conversations uh, private, again, you may need to go out and purchase some sort of apparatus which are available. The free enterprise system is a wonderful thing. Uh, every time the law expands the police's rights, uh, you get some apparatus which will, uh, which will help to counteract that. And you can buy electronic apparatus which will uh, garble uh, uh, eavesdropping, electronic eavesdropping and wiretapping. Uh, so again, uh, you may have to stock up on, uh, on uh, more electronic merchandise if you want to keep your conversations entirely private. And of course, uh, with the new electronic merchandise, uh, the new electronic means it's not only the police that may be listening in, uh, you may have uh, somebody who's angry at you, an employer who's suspicious of you, a, a girlfriend or boyfriend who's mad at you. So you've, you're at, your privacy is at risk uh, with regard to uh, your telephone conversations. The most uh, contemporary example, I think, of this is the, uh, uh, the use of drug testing on the job. Again, uh, this is a, uh, in my view and the view of some of the judges, is really a uh, search. Uh, if your uh, blood is going to be taken for a test, uh, that would seem to me to be a very intimate uh, search. Yet the federal government, uh, which is uh, supposedly not to do a search uh, uh, without a warrant, is imposing a rule on federal employees that uh, they can, uh, without any suspicion that you're a drug user of any kind, that they can take your blood uh, and examine it Without, uh, without any warning and without any probable cause, without any particular reason to believe that you're behaving improperly. This question is in the courts right now, and the judges, both federal and state, are dealing with it in all its various ramifications, whether the testing agency is the United States of America, whether the testing agency is your private employer, how often the tests occur, what kind of justification uh, or probable cause is needed for the tests, the reliability of the tests, the uh, privilege to have retesting if the test is negative. It's going on in the Army, federal employment, and private employment as well. And the courts are very much involved in it. And this is a matter that's got to concern all of us. Uh, I, uh, I work for myself, and many people in the United States work for themselves, but most of us work for large organizations and to the extent large organizations have this power and authority there's a real uh, our privacy as a realistic in a realistic sense has been uh, very much uh, very much weakened so again uh, we have an area in which there's tension between law enforcement personnel and between the rights of privacy uh, there are many other areas in which this tension exists. Uh, one is the use of, uh, so, of uh, income tax returns. Our income tax returns are supposed to be private, but more and more we're, we're required to, just to, give, to quote voluntarily give up our income tax returns in order to get credit from a bank, uh, in order to uh, litigate a lawsuit, and other matters. So we're living in a society, particularly because of the increased power of electronic uh, surveillance and computers and uh, data processing, where our privacy is being diminished gradually. And the courts, in my view, unfortunately, 
have gone along, partly because of the serious drug problem we seem to have or we think we have in this culture, the courts, instead of being uh, instead of safeguarding the liberty and privacy of Americans, the courts are going along with the program and creating and helping to create a situation where our privacy is diminished and we are more and more uh, at the mercy of large agencies who have the power to inquire into the details of our personal life. Now, I think that whether you're in favor of this tendency or you're against this tendency, it points up to all of us how the personnel on our courts are not just an abstract matter, but involve the very essence of our lives as Americans. So if you want to be concerned about these matters, you've got to be concerned about the makeup of our judiciary, who you elect to office who appoints judges and who you vote for uh, for judges because these judges are the ones who are deciding how the Constitution operates today in the circumstances we have today they're very different than 200 years ago and it's up to human beings these judges are human beings like you and me to make these decisions and therefore I urge all of you to be concerned about the judges who are in our courts so that your interests will be protected in just the way that you think is suitable. Thank you for being with us today. This has been Inside Law. I'm your host, Gerald Goldfarb. If you have any questions or comments about our show today, please write to me, care of this station. Thank you again. This is Inside Law, and good day. For further information, please call Inside Law at area code 213-285-8599.